Hey guys, welcome back. So today I want to talk about a very cool piece of assault weapons history. The pistol that I have here in my hands kind of started the whole craze where Congress wanted to get involved and start banning everything under the sun that had certain evil features like this barrel shroud and threaded barrel and something that accepted high capacity magazines like this 30, 32 round 9 millimeter magazine. The pistol that I'm holding is the Tech DC-9. Now this is a later evolutionary step of a pistol that was known by many different names. Originally the gun was designed in Sweden by a company called Interdynamic and Interdynamic designed it as the MP9 submachine gun which fired from an open bolt. When they didn't win any military contracts they brought the pistol to the United States under a company name of Intratech and sold it as the KG-9. The KG-9 in 1985 fired from an open bolt. The ATF didn't care for semi-automatic open bolt pistols or firearms in general and very quickly banned them. So you couldn't manufacture them as open bolts anymore. So Intertech decided to go ahead and take the same basic pistol, make it not fire from an open bolt, made it use a striker assembly, so now it fired from a closed bolt, and they called it the KG-99. This pistol wound up being used by uh, criminals in various you know, high profile shootings, which then prompted the state of California to ban the pistol by name. After that, Intertech designed or called the gun the DC Tech 9, changed the model name and tried to rebrand the pistol on the US market. And that continued on until it was banned by name in 1994 under the Clinton administration under the assault weapons ban. The assault weapons ban didn't like certain features, but also did list 19 firearms by name, and this was one of them, but they didn't like barrel shrouds and bar threaded barrels and stocks with pistol grips. That's where we got the thumb hole stock, all sorts of craziness that ultimately sunset in 2004. Now this pistol went out of production in 2001 and was no longer sold in the United States, but while that ban was on, it was still sold as the AB-10. The AB-10 had a very short barrel, didn't have a barrel shroud, the barrel wasn't threaded, and it came with a 10 round magazine. This gun does fire, as I mentioned, from a closed bolt, has a charging handle over here on the left-hand side of the receiver, has very crude stamped sights, which you can see here, but what made it somewhat unique was the fact that it has a polymer lower receiver. The top half of the gun is made out of a piece of tube steel. It's parkerized. The barrel is threaded. It's a very short barrel, and of course, it's in 9 millimeter. It's an interesting gun. What was really cool about the gun, now I remember these guns well as a kid growing up in the 80s. The gun was used quite a bit by Hollywood. I remember seeing this gun used in Miami Vice. Uh, Hollywood loved it. They used it all over the place. Politicians absolutely hated it. Again, it was one of the, the first pistols that was demonized or the first assault weapons, one of the first assault, assault weapons that were demonized. And it even become, it became well known to a whole new generation in the 90s when it was used by the Columbine shooters. This gun uh, made an appearance there, unfortunately. So because of all that history, the gun really was somewhat demonized. And it made a lot of people want to buy them. I mean, these things were dirt cheap when they were originally sold. You could pick them up, I think, for like $179 or something. They're really, really, really affordable. But now the prices on them have skyrocketed. They become, have become collector's items. This is a 32 round 9mm magazine that the gun was commonly seen with, but they also had 10 round, 20 round, 32 rounds, which this one is, 50 round stick magazines, and then they had a 72 round drum. You'd also find other accessories, which they called the assault grip, which would attach right here, it gave it a second forward vertical pistol grip, and some stocks were available. The original submachine gun had a wire stock. You'll find some SBRs out there that'll have that stock system on it. Overall, the gun is pretty much junk. Uh, they weren't known for being reliable. They weren't known for being well made. They were known for being dirt cheap and commonly available. I remember seeing these things all over at the gun shows, and I think that's ultimately what it was, its undoing was. It was dirt cheap, poorly made, and demonized by the media, and of course attacked by all the politicians out there in the United States. Let's take this thing out to the range, do a little bit of shooting with it, and show you what it looks like when it's being fired.
we have 20 rounds loaded into the 32 round magazine. Insert the magazine, locks into place, charge the weapon like that. She's ready to go. The sights are somewhat crude, just stamped sheet metal, kind of like a Mac 10, but it has a that doesn't have an aperture on the rear, a peep. It's just a regular blade rear sight. Trigger's actually fairly light on this thing. Actually is somewhat accurate. <laughs> Check that out, except for one crazy shot over here. I have 30 rounds loaded into a 32 round magazine. This is 115 grain Federal range ammunition. It is courtesy of Federal. I'm going to load the gun, seat the magazine, charge it. Now, because the magazine sets outside of the pistol grip forward of the firing hand, the gun is a little bit nose heavy, so firing it like a traditional handgun can be a bit challenging. It is a bit heavy. Totally doable, but it isn't the most comfortable thing to do. I will say it's better than some of the other 9mm crossover submachine gun slash assault weapons that I fired out there, but still it's not the most comfortable way to shoot the gun. Some folks would probably have fired it like this with the barrel shroud, which gave uh, Diane Feinstein fits, putting that second hand up there, or even firing it like this with your hand around the magazine. Now keep in mind, you'll see my thumbs riding up, this charging handle reciprocates with the bolt when the gun fires. If you get your thumb up there, it's gonna get whacked and it could hurt, it's definitely gonna cause a malfunction. So you can shoot the gun like this. Or you can shoot it like this perhaps. You wanna make sure your hand doesn't get out there by that muzzle, okay, because you can really hurt yourself. This one does have a muzzle break on it, but if you get your hand out over it, it's gonna leave a mark. Or even like this perhaps. What's funny is I'm hitting the exact same spot on the paper. It points really, really nice. I mean, take a look at that. Pan down there. I keep hitting the same spot in the paper, and I wasn't even using the sights. The thing really does point quite naturally. Now, of course, the fun way to shoot the gun would be to hip fire the gun, holding it like this, and just have at it. I don't think I'm going to hit the same spot. All right, so I started off firing a little bit low, and then I, could, I just walked it up onto the target. That is a fun little gun. It is running 100% for us this afternoon. I, I know I said these things aren't known for the reliability, but this one's running pretty good. Definitely an interesting piece of history. Let's take a look inside the DC-9. Now, I do want to warn you guys ahead of time, I not only have a Tech-9, which is, of course, very evil all on its own, but I also have a disassembly tool here, better known as an M855 ball round. The ATF is trying to ban this because it's a cop killer. These two together, something bad could happen. All right, so to take it apart, first, you're going to want to clear it. Drop the magazine out. It has a little AK-style magazine release down here on the bottom. You hit that with your thumb, pull the magazine out. Check to make sure that the weapon's clear. Pull the bolt to the rear. I also want to point out that with this charging handle, you can push it in, and when it locks in, you're unable to, to retract the bolt. To retract the bolt, you have to pull up on it, then you can pull it to the rear, all right? I think the reason they did that, it was kind of a feature you saw on some submachine guns. Um, if you want to make the weapon safe, you hit that cocking handle, charging handle, lock it. Now the bolt can't move. So if it were to be dropped, if it was because open bolt machine guns, uh, if the bolt goes to the rear and goes forward, of course, it'll strip around and fire. If it's dropped, the gun can't be made to fire. So that's kind of a holdover, I think, from the submachine gun days. All right, so we've made sure that the weapon's clear. Now we're going to take this evil M855 ball around and use it as a disassembly tool and push this pin out that's here in the front. Once you get the pin out, the upper and the lower separate from each other, just like that. Looking inside this thing, it just screams cheap. It also screams open bolt submachine gun. When you pull the trigger, you'll see this little sear, which would normally be, normally be uh, called a auto sear. As you pull the trigger, you can see this drop down. It's original design. When that was pulled down far enough, the bolt would be allowed to travel forward, strip around from the magazine, and fire. When they converted it to a semi-automatic closed bolt design, this now holds the striker to the rear. 
while the bolt's closed. And what's kind of cool is when the striker goes forward, this is the disconnector here. You'll see when the uh, striker comes forward, it hits this disconnector, pops that back up, and now it resets it so it only fires one round. All polymer, very, very cheaply made, mostly of stampings and really corny looking springs. Not something that's probably going to hold up to a whole lot of use. All right, this is where things get interesting. This is the rear end of the receiver. You'll notice this big slot here. That big slot looks like it could probably accept a quarter. You have to unscrew this end cap to continue the disassembly process. Sorry about my band-aid on my thumb there, guys, but uh, I hurt myself. All right, so this is not easy. It's extremely crude. But once you get it far enough, the little end cap will pop off. This little dingus here on the end sets in the lower receiver and it keeps the rear end uh, from rising out when you have the two together. You can see the hole right here in the rear end. Okay. So once you get that end cap off, the recoil spring and the striker spring come out together. You can see in the bottom side of the receiver here as they come out. And now you just have a bolt and a striker and a firing pin in there. To get them out, you pull the charging handle to the rear to the takedown notch, which is right here. Hold on. There we go. All right, take it to the takedown notch, lift this out, and now the bolt, striker, and firing pin will come out, and they just set inside here. Just pull out, and you'll see how this little guy's just holding the firing pin. That's your striker assembly. So that's the entire gun. This is the bolt. Very crude and just a round tube of sheet metal. I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at the Tech 9. This is a very interesting piece of history. It's sad to see it go from the market, even though it is a complete piece of junk. I still hate seeing guns like this disappear from the market. Now, as I mentioned, they did stop making them in 2001, but if you want to pick one up, you can find them on places like Gun Broker. They're not horribly expensive, but I have noticed they become harder and harder to find. I did want to clarify one thing as well. The charging handle, I, I noted earlier that you can push it in and lock the bolt in the forward position, and it probably is a holdover from the open bolt submachine gun days, but I also remembered that it is actually a safety. So the gun right now is cocked. If I push this in and lock the bolt in the forward position, it also disables the striker assembly so the gun can't fire. Pull it out, and now the gun can fire. If you guys have any questions about the Tech 9 or anything else, you can ask those questions on our Facebook page. I'll put a link in the description below. I also invite you to come by and check out Copper Custom. It's our online store. If you want to support the Military Arms Channel, that's the best way to do it. Please come by Copper Custom, check it out, take a look at all the stuff we have. We have some very good prices. Thanks again, everybody, for watching. We'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah.